which also saw upper caste students setting themselves on fire in protest. While the merits and demerits of this step can be debated forever, the fact is that two years later, the Supreme Court upheld the decision and the 27% reservation that had been introduced. Finally, B.P. Singh also sacrificed his government to prevent the Babri Masjid from being demolished, resisting the first attempt of the Vishwendu Parishad to do so. And in these conflicted times of today, that remains a beacon of secularism. So all these reasons prompted me to attempt this biography. Thank, Thank you. you. A very good evening. We are extremely excited and thrilled to take forward the next discussion, My Journey with Agatha Christie. We have with us Helen Smith, who will be in conversation with Dr. Mark Aldridge. Dr. Mark Aldridge is an Associate Professor of Screen Histories at Solent University, Southampton, UK. His most recent book is Agatha Christie's Poirot, The Greatest Detective in the World, which celebrates a century of the fictional detective. He previously told the full story of Agatha Christie on film and television in Agatha Christie on screen. Our next guest today with us is Helen Smith. Helen Smith is a British novelist who lives in London. Her first two books, Alice in Wonderland and Being Light, feature Alison Temple, a private detective who works at an all-time female detective agency in London. The Miracle Inspector is a dystopian thriller set in England in the near future. The Emily Castle's mysteries are entertaining mysteries featuring a mature Emily Sleuth Castles, she received an International Thriller Writer's Award for Best Short Story in 2019. I now request Helen Smith to begin the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as you can see, we're, we're, we're online for the Pune International Literary Festival. Uh, we're lucky enough to have a, a renowned Agatha Christie expert here to talk to us. Dr. Mark Aldridge. So I'm going to be, <laughs> hello Mark, I'm going to be asking him a little bit about Agatha Christie herself and then a little bit about why he was so drawn to Agatha Christie um, to research her. Um, he's, um, as you would have heard, a senior lecturer at Solent University at Solent University, but he's also written a couple of books about Agatha Christie. He's written Agatha Christie on screen, and also, I'm not sure if that's showing up in the, in the camera, but um, Agatha Christie Poirot, um, The Greatest Detective in the World. And this book, and again, we'll talk about this a little bit later with Mark, but it's fascinating. If you're an expert, you're going to love it because it's it's an exhaustive um, book talking about all all the Poirot books and the adaptations for, for screen and for stage and everything else. Um, but it's also very accessible and very entertaining. And so if you don't know very much about Agatha Christie or you want to know more, you're definitely going to enjoy it because it's written, it's written. It's written for everyone and there's the wry wit that comes through. So um, Congratulations on that, Mark. So let's begin our talk. Um, I'm just going to, you're the expert, so I'm going to let, I'm going to let you do most of the talking, having, having set this up. Um, I, uh, for, um, I, I think it's extraordinary that, a, that 100 years after that first book was published, we're here talking about her um, at an international festival that's hosted in India. And I wonder if, you can tell us at what point in Agatha Christie's life did, would she have known that that was going to be her legacy? Oh, that's really interesting. That's a really good question because, so for people who don't know, her first novel, a detective novel, was published in 1920, um, Mysterious Affair at Styles. Um, and it did well. You know, it, it isn't become sort of a phenomenon but it did well it established her um and actually it was during the the towards the latter half of the 1920s that she started to become recognized as 
one of the greatest detective story writers of the era, um, along with several other people. You know, she wasn't the only one, but, but recognised as being in that top tier. When she started to write things like The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, which I won't spoil for anybody, but does very clever things with the detective fiction form, um, and was starting to really reach her peak then. Um, so she started to have a good idea from the late 1920s. That's when she started to write as a profession. Up to that point, she hadn't really considered herself to be a professional writer. It was sort of something that she did for fun and just sort of kept her going for her interests. Um, but in the late 20s, when she separated from her first husband, that is when she actually started to become quite self-sufficient, uh, more so than she had been. So she started to get a bit of a sense then, I think, that she was writing writing stuff that people really enjoy. And then in the 1930s, that's when she writes many of what we recognise as the all-time classics, things like Murder on the Orient Express, Death on the Nile, and then there were none. Um, but even at that point, I don't think she felt that it was necessarily going to be a huge legacy because she... She did funny little things, like in some books, she would give away the solution to earlier books, just sort of casually, a detective would mention, oh yes, it's like that case where X did this. And he would read it go, wow, she didn't think people were gonna go back and read these later. She thought, you sort of read them on publication, you might pick them up a few years later. But of course, the way we read her now is that you might read Murder on the Orient Express before you know one written 10 years earlier. So I think it took a while for her to really realise that there was going to be this legacy. And then by the time she got to the 50s and 60s, the 1950s and 60s, um, she is actually really starting to think about the fact that she realises that as she approaches her 60th, 70th birthdays, she's got to think about what's going to happen when she dies and has to think, protect her family and think about that. So I think that was the point when actually she was going, oh, I still seem to be quite popular, <laughs> very popular. And my, the, the mousetrap is running and there's no sign of it stopping. And so maybe I've got to think about what happens when I'm gone. But I don't think she had any idea that, that she would still be spoken about in the way that we recognise her now. 45 years after her death, she had absolutely no concept of that what, whatsoever. And actually, if you speak to her grandson, he tells this story about how in the 1980s, she died in 1976, and in the early 1980s, her then agent and publisher sort of mutually said to the family in Agatha Christie Limited, well, this is what happens when an author dies, is that they sell more copies in the following year or two because people are suddenly interested in them again. And then there's this sort of slow decline that people sort of stop buying them and they get forgotten about. And as, as Matthew has said, he said, thankfully they were wrong because actually anything but, um, and I believe, I mean, I'm not privy to sales figures, but from what has been said, she, she did exceptionally well during lockdown, you know, especially last year. Um, so people are really buying her stuff maybe as much as ever, if not maybe even more than at any time since she died, certainly. So very, very popular still. She certainly didn't see that coming. I, yes, I know. I, authors often ask their agents or ask, ask other authors, you know, well, how can I have a bestseller? And one of the most reliable pieces of advice is, when well, you could always die. Because as you, <laughs> as you say, there suddenly will be that surge of interest, but you expect it to peak and then to go down. Whereas, of course, with Agatha Christie, um, she's still there's no sign of stopping, is there? Um, uh, uh, it's uh, was she was she still writing right up until her death? Yeah, so she she uh, died, say, in January 1976, she was 85 years old, and she was writing up until the early 1970s, um, so it was only the last few years of her life that she actually stopped. Um, so what you end up with was her sort of, she used to do a Christie for Christmas, which is very fitting for the time of year that we're discussing this. But for, for certainly the last sort of 18 or so years of her life, that generally is what she did, was one big book a year for various reasons um, and it started to become a bit more difficult so in part because she had other things she wanted to do so if she wanted to write a play then she wanted to spend time on that rather than a new so sometimes there'd be things like it would be a collection of short stories that had never been put in book form before maybe it had been in magazines so so they started to occasionally have years where she didn't actually have to have a new book but what she did very cleverly and quite famously 
is that actually she had written a couple of novels earlier in her career that she was saving for after she died. And one of them was published after she died, Sleeping Murder. Uh, but the other one, Curtain, which is Poirot's last case, they actually did publish at the end of 1975. So only a few years, a few months, sorry, before she died. So um, that was and that was with her agreement because they spoke to her and the, the, the feeling very much was that she was never going to write another novel. But one of my favourite things, and, and it's a story that's in one of the biographies, I'm afraid I can't remember if it's Laura Thompson's or Janet Morgan's, but there's a really good story that I love where somebody went to see her in the last couple of years of her, her life um, and they spoke to her about a, a really boring thing, really, which is that they were using um, this fluid that you use for false teeth, to clean false teeth. Uh, they were using it to clean their silver. And they said that as soon as they said this sort of quite odd little fact, Agatha Christie sort of perked up and they were like, you could see she was thinking, oh, that might be an interesting thing for a story. Whether she was thinking you could put poison in, in you know, cleaning fluid for false teeth or something, we don't know. But she was really elderly at this point. I think that she was either 84 or 85. And it was interesting that even at that point, she was still listening out for potential stories because that's what she did. You know, the writing of a story, as I'm sure you know, Helen, it's not just you down at the keyboard tapping out words. The writing is done in your head. You know, you do that. That is the difficult bit, getting it in, in place. And so that's what she used to do. That's why she had these notebooks that John Curran and, and others, including myself, have gone through over the years. She would write down a list of ideas and then rework them and cross them out and save some for another story and then put some in another. So her writing was constant, but it wasn't just her and a typewriter. It's her thinking and noting and listening that I think is really interesting. And yeah, and, and squirreling, squirreling away those ideas and having notebooks and being inspired by, 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 by people. What, what was it that first uh, prompted her to write that first book? Because I think taking that first step sometimes is huge. Yeah. Um, can you tell us about that? I can. So, so she was born in 1890 and in the early 1900s, she did do some writing of her own. So not detective fiction, but poems, some short stories, uh, some of which were published later, others weren't. Um, she wrote a, 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 a novel um, in about 1908, uh, so she was 18, which is not a detective novel. Um, and it was sort of about a bit of a romance, a bit of a melodrama about a group of friends who meet in Cairo, which is where she sort of come out as an adult um, and uh, uh, their sort of intertwining relationships. Uh, but that wasn't published, but she sent it off to a couple of people for advice and she got really good advice from these people as well. And then sort of put her writing a bit on the back burner, but you know, she was doing other things. Obviously, the Second World War came along um, and she met Archie, her first husband. But what actually happened was that she loved Sherlock Holmes and loved detective fiction, including people like Gaston Leroux, who wrote, um, uh, 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 well, actually, Phantom of the Opera and, and Mystery of the Yellow Room and all sorts of things. Um, and what she did was she had a conversation with her sister Madge and Madge said that she felt that Agatha would not be able to write a piece of detective fiction that you wouldn't be able to solve. And I think this is the important thing. It wasn't just saying, oh, I don't think you can write a bit of detective fiction, but I don't think you'd be able to fool the reader in the way that the best detective fiction writers could. Um, and Agatha sort of was interested by this idea and thought about some ideas um, and then got ill, had flu or cold, um, and went to recuperate. Um, and that was the point at which she went to a hotel on Dartmoor and really sort of finished off this story and wrote it. And um, it did indeed win that bet. But this was in 1916, so the middle of the First World War, and she sent it off to a few people and there wasn't much interest. Uh, but eventually it sort of did the rounds and she did get a publisher, The Bodily Head, um, who said, yes, actually, we would quite like to publish this. And this was years later, it wasn't published, wasn't published in the UK until 1921, so five years later. So I guess if there are any people watching this who think that there, it's taking a while for their stuff to be published, don't lose faith because Agatha Christie didn't. She'd sort of forgotten about it. She did say later, oh, I, I'd forgotten about it, actually. Um, 
uh, or that it had been sent out. And then one day they said, okay, we'll pay you a small amount of money, give you a very poor contract. Um, again, that's pretty typical for authors. Um, and we'll publish it. So she stuck with Bodley Head then for six books, um, but their terms were so bad that she very happily escaped from them after six books, which rather put their noses out of joint. So that's a lesson for publishers as well. You've got to treat your writers well, because if they do well, they'll want to escape from you at the first opportunity if you've given, given them a bad contract. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so Mysterious Affair Styles did well. Wasn't like a phenomenon, as I say. It wasn't like it was the book everyone was talking about, but did well. Did well enough that Bodley Head picked up their contract for five more books, which was sort of a mixture of more adventure thriller books and mysteries and one collection of short stories so she was really trying out lots of different things early in her career as well i think she's such a, she's such an inspiration because she's so famous and she was prolific um, and and uh and and her legacy continues that for younger people who are thinking about writing it's so interesting to hear the background and 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 in your book uh, as well as talking about the books themselves you give these uh, lovely little tidbits about what she was thinking uh, letters that she wrote uh, sometimes quite cross letters that she wrote to her <laughs> and so on and I, and I think though it's, it's interesting isn't it um if people are starting out to think Oh, but I started out writing poetry. Um, you know, not everyone has to start by writing a, a whole novel. Sometimes those little bits, or even just having a notebook and just writing down little bits and pieces. Um, I, I was lucky enough to go uh, to Pune um, in 2016, and I was very struck by um, the youth of a lot of the audience, not just the university students, but also children, uh, a lot of children there who wanted to become writers. And so I would imagine she would, you know, Agatha Christie would be an inspiration to them. So yeah. I'd, be, I'd be interested to hear now what drew you to Agatha Christie. You know, you this is your this is your life's work to, to uh, at the moment, isn't it? To to be a historian, a researcher. You travel all over the world you, because you're an expert talking about her and your passion. Even in the in um, the, the short time that we've been talking here online, your love for her and your passion for her really, really shines through. Um, so you're not just somebody who who is assessing her work. You, you love her, and I wondered. So when when did you when were you first drawn to her? Can you can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So like a lot of Agatha Christie fans, if not most, um, it was when I was at that cusp of discovering adult reading. So, so moving from sort of children's books into to stuff that's a bit more for grown ups. And so, my mum is an Agatha Christie fan, and so she had most of the Agatha Christie novels. We used to have this this little sort of bookmark that we picked up in 1990 when there was the centenary event, 100 years since her birth, and we had this little bookmark with all of the list of her books on it uh, this is pre-internet so that was the like uh, it was gold dust to us to know wow those are all the books because mum was never quite sure whether she had all of them so we used to go around and try and pick up the ones that she was missing but um I just loved it you know and I, I loved reading uh, her, her her books um I read them in a completely random order I can't quite remember what the first one was but I think it might have been why didn't they ask Evans which is a very jolly adventure mystery um that it isn't terribly difficult to read either so I was I don't know I was still in primary school certainly when I read it probably 10 I guess um and so really nicely accessible which a lot of her, her most of her work is anyway but yes yeah, so I love that but I also loved the adaptations I love the David Suchet Poirot series we always watched we love the Joan Hicks and Miss Marples so for somebody who really was passionate about film and tv and loved Agatha Christie. I loved all of this sort of stuff. And then when I did my PhD and my further sort of earlier academic career, film and television historian is what I do uh, mostly. So it's about um, you know uh, the early days of television and stuff like that. And I'd never really crossed them over before because I loved Agatha Christie and I didn't want to ruin my love of Agatha Christie by making it into work. Um, but then I, I started to become really annoyed that there wasn't a book 
that really gave an in-depth history of all these adaptations. Because I was like, why has nobody done it? It's crazy nobody's done it. And I just sort of decided one day that I would do it. And I don't know why, but I just thought I'm going to bite the bullet and actually do it and see what happens. And the reaction to that, which was an academic book, it was Palgrave Macmillan. It wasn't something you could go and buy in most bookshops or anything. But even on that small scale, the interest there was in it was phenomenal. And I thought, wow, I've really tapped into something here that I love doing and other people love speaking about. So I'm not going to stop. So I then thought, well, the thing I really want is to have maybe one book or maybe more. We'll see where you can look up every Agatha Christie title and get the background information about it, learn what's interesting about it, get a bit of a, an idea as to where it sits within her career, any nice trivia, how it was reviewed, all of this context. And just sort of, you know, maybe a dozen pages, sorry, half a dozen or so pages about every book um, and play and film. And so I spoke to her publisher um, and I'd met the editor at an Agatha Christie festival and said, well, how about it? And a mere two or so years later, <laughs> everybody says, OK, well, let's go for it. And we did. And that's where, where Poirot came from. I said, well, I can't do all of them. So let's try one book. Let's try focusing on Poirot because it was his centenary in 2020, 100 years since Styles, And uh, so we did. So I did it and it was a massive task. It really was huge, but very, very satisfying. I, I absolutely loved doing it. And I'm really proud of the book. Um, well, actually, which I don't always get to say because you know any writer knows that you don't love everything that you did. But I am very proud of Poirot achieved exactly what I wanted it to achieve. And I can't really ask for more than that, I don't think. No, it's had brilliant reviews. And, and I should have mentioned at the beginning for people who are thinking they'd like to get hold of it, there are no spoilers in it. So, <laughs> you know, I think that's quite important, is it? Because sometimes when I think I want to read a book, um, a novel i i you have to be careful even reading on the back because they i like to just go in completely cold so with the, with your book um you yes you you do discuss obviously the, what what happens in, in in the book but but there are no spoilers no nobody would need to think oh i better not you know i better not look at that that bit because i haven't read that one yet it's almost a way of sort of thinking oh i like what he says about that that's interesting um and as you say, you can dip in. You don't. You don't have to read it cover to cover. You might just think, "Oh, I was thinking about reading Murder on yeah. Orient Express. I wonder if that's uh, if that's right for me." Um, like you, I started reading at about ten. Um, that was my my sort of. That was also my gateway to adult reading. I think mm. what's really good about it is that you can put these books, the Agatha Christie books, into the hands of 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 a, a young adult or, or a child, knowing that um, there's not going to be anything that's too disturbing. Well, they can be quite dark in the sense that they're about murder, um, but there's there's nothing that you you know you wouldn't want your 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 young nephew or your young niece or your or, or, or a child of yours um, to to read. Um, I wondered. Um, you 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 do say in the book that actually. Some of the books that Agatha Christie herself was most fond of weren't necessarily the ones that her readers were most fond of. Which ones um, can you can you uh, tell people? Which uh, and also, of course, I, I don't. We always think of her as being, you know, the novelist, um, but she had also written plays. The most famous, of course, The Mouse Trap, but others. So, so it's, it's taking all all of her work, um, mm. which which can you tell us that she was most famous? Uh, most most uh, most fond of sorry. But no, it's right. It's interesting because she would write occasionally. She she would respond to fans or uh, various other correspondents by listing her favourite. Um, stories or novels um, and actually people who are really keen the Agatha Christie website has got like an early 1970s list that she wrote to a Japanese fan and that's got it's got the sort of titles that you would expect actually that list things like Murder on the Orient Express and Murder of Roger Ackroyd and then, then there were none and so so that that's a bit more straightforward I, the, the list that I think you're thinking about which is a really interesting one is when it was clear that she wasn't going to be well enough to um, write another novel at least anytime soon. She did speak to her 
agent and publisher and say, well, perhaps you could publish my you know, collection of my favourites, uh, what you might call, you know, the chef selection or something. Uh, and she says, it's really interesting, the list, that very few of them are murder mysteries, relatively, compared to the fact that most of her books are murder mysteries. And she really concentrates on the ones that are much more about relationships and often are quite sentimental, um, which... She does have sentimentality in, in lots of her books, but it, it very rarely dominates. It's usually maybe one sort of subplot or something. But the ones that she were picking were ones that she'd written when she was quite young, for the most part. And they were ones that were very much about, yeah, sort of young people in love and uh, uh, relationships of all sorts of kinds. And, and when I say love, it's all sorts of different love, not necessarily romantic love, but about different sort of relationships. So. Those were the things that she, she towards the end of her life, really was quite nostalgic for, um, which I think is really interesting. And I don't think she's alone in that, that, that you know, any of us who've had older relatives who perhaps are less well and, and often will go back and remember things from their youth and, and think about them in a much more positive way than perhaps they even felt at the time. So she knew that she had sort of her classics, you know, that, that, that were widely accepted as a sort of canon of Agatha Christie greats. But on a personal level, she tended to like the, the ones that were very much about relationships and, um, character-led ones so on her list they are things like short stories which were collected at various points that actually don't even have a crime in them or that are perhaps have tommy and tuppence in them with several of them i seem to recall where you know they obviously for those people who don't know i guess but they were a, a couple that we meet in one of her youngest books and they uh, one of her earliest books and they fall in love whilst investigating various crimes and we follow their relationship over several years and actually they feature in her last novel, Post and the Fate. The last one she wrote was a book called Post and the Fate, um, which I don't think anybody will tell you is a great book. Uh, she's quite elderly by this point. But it's really interesting that at the end, she goes back to these, this sort of couple who she had written about in, in one of her first books in the early 1920s, um, and then clearly was suddenly nostalgic for, and she revisited them then, at, you know, uh, decades later. So it's really the stuff she wrote when she was young, she seemed to suddenly have a lot of affection for later in her life. And I think sometimes I think you know when you've when you've created something you know and there are so that you know there are so many of her books. I think that you start to feel like oh what a shame I really loved that one and then nobody pays any attention to them. Yeah. And almost as if they you know almost as if they have a personality um, as if they might be as if you know she'd had sort of more than sixty children or perhaps you know great grandchildren or something and you were thinking oh that one's the little attention seeker and I do love that one but you know what about this quiet one in the corner and uh, what about what about for you um if somebody um there may be people watching this who um who've seen who've seen the films or, or seen the most recent kenneth branagh film for example uh, depending on you know how young they are or or who's just sort of read like you say they've they've picked an agatha christie off uh um off the shelf and and just just read it because they like reading um and then they're eager for more so i suppose this is a two-part question one is like what what are your what are your favourites, including including again the, the, perhaps the films as well as the books? And then if if you wanted to put one into somebody's hands, and I know it's really difficult to choose one, perhaps you perhaps you'd put a stack into their hands. Which which would those be? Well, uh, my advice for somebody who hasn't read Agatha Christie is don't go for one of the big famous ones first because they are usually much more satisfying once you've read more Agatha Christie because they often offer a twist on the format or some sort of surprise that you're not expecting and that can be much more powerful if you have read a lot more <laughs> of her books and therefore you recognize that it's a surprise. I think um if I were to say there's one that you, you know, if you really want to know what Agatha Christie is about, though, that, that and then there were none, you really can't go wrong with that as a first novel, I think. Um, and that's probably her best in many ways. Um, but I, I've got to say that if you pick any Poirot or Marple novel that's 
probably published before 1960. There are great books after 1960, but they're a little bit more hit and miss. Um, you've got a really good chance of it being a, a really good book. Um, there are a few slight duds in the sort of uh, earlier decades. But if it's Poirot or Miss Marple and it's pre-1960-ish, you've got a pretty good chance that, that, that it'll be great. And I'm a great defender of her later work, by the way, but I think for a first read. But the one that I, there are a couple that I've recommended to people. Um, so if people want to take me up on a recommendation, these are my two. Um, one is A Murder is Announced, which is a Miss Marple book, which is brilliant in so many ways and uh, the thing that I really love about it is that it's got something to say about British society uh, so it's a fantastically constructed mystery it's interesting all the way through the characters leap out from the page it's an absolutely brilliant novel but also you watch it or you read it rather as something that is talking about 1950s British society. And it's absolutely hilarious. There's so many funny things in it. Like the whole premise of the book is that someone has placed an advert in the newspaper to say a murder will be taking place at this place at this time. And of course, it being written, nobody wants to actually come and say, so what's this murder thing all about? So actually everybody in the village is making an excuse to come and see, go visit that house at that time to see what's actually going on. So people come in and say, oh, I thought I'd return this book or oh, I wanted to check your central heating and see what it's like. Yeah, any old excuse because of course the British can't actually be direct about it. Um, so that's a brilliant one I think to, to start. Um, and another one that I love which is, is one of the most forgotten um, but I think is a really accessible first Agatha Christie is uh, a Poirot novel called Mrs McGinty's Dead uh, in which Poirot who's very you know, fastidious, very, very smart, has to go and sort of uh, slum it slightly, uh, finding out in a sort of bed and breakfast lodging uh, to find out the truth about well, Mrs McGinty's murder and is in a sort of country village. And it's really funny. Uh, so it's highly entertaining. It's got a really good mystery. It's got a couple of really nice sort of twists in the tale as you go through it. Um, I mean, it's not one that is absolutely top 10 of everything she ever wrote but she wrote 66 novels you know, detective novels so uh, you, you can be pretty sure that um it's it's a very solid very entertaining very accessible first mystery and i love it and it's really underrated so those would be my two recommendations um and in terms of ones that i love it is the big ones but actually um, I, I really enjoy those ones that are lesser known. So Mrs. McGinty's Dead, um, Sad Cypress, I absolutely love. Um, and there's great pleasure in revisiting them as well and going, oh, you know, I used to read it just as a mystery. And when you read it again, you're like, oh, I missed this sort of social commentary or this comedy or how interesting this character is. So there's great pleasure in rereading, especially the, the less famous ones and finding new things every time. And, and also rereading once you know who's done it, or once you know, because of course she's so famous for the for the for the plotting, which is which is really clever. Mm -hmm. um, and then going back and then checking or or knowing that that she hasn't cheated, mm -hmm. um, and then satisfaction in that as well, isn't there? And I think when you, um, especially if you're younger and you you start out 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 reading them you take it for granted that it's brilliantly done and then I think as you get older and you and you read other things and you and you see that you know obviously some novelists are they're brilliant with characters or you know with their descriptions or the language um, perhaps less so with the plotting you realize how important it is and I think would you agree that one of the reasons perhaps that that there are so many then film and tv adaptations is because you must have a good plot on on screen for it to work otherwise it's just um, i mean is is that one of the reasons do you think that she then continues to live on uh else, you know elsewhere on screen on stage absolutely yeah you're, you're spot on i i completely agree it's this thing about that <clears throat> her books are not that long um, certainly by modern standards, which means that her plotting is very um, sort of it's very tightly plotted. They they usually aren't sort of uh, books that have got loads of subplots that go nowhere. There are a few exceptions, but usually you're very focused on on a few particular strands, and that's great for film and TV. If you want to do a hundred minute film or TV program, 
than to have this sort of you know, 220, 250 page book that you can uh, condense down quite easily. But she, she does this also, this brilliant thing, which people can take for granted of having immediately identifiable characters. So you know who is who really, really quickly. Um, and that's much tougher than it might seem. And I've read a lot of um, sort of contemporary crime fiction and it's something I struggle with a lot in writers that aren't Agatha Christie is I'm constantly having to flip back and go oh who's Graham you know which guy's this and is that one of the twins and you know whereas with Agatha Christie she very clearly identifies who's who and that is brilliant for a film if you want to have you know eight suspects perhaps then you know right away oh well that's the sort of philanderer your brother and that that's the lord of the manor and that that's the maid and all this sort of stuff which means that you can get straight to the plot and the plot as you say it doesn't cheat you know it really doesn't cheat she doesn't cheat she knew that people would be checking there are rules that she sort of kept to mostly once or twice sort of broke but broke with good reason i think that the detection club had sort of set up um and so she knew that people wanted her to play fair and she always did that doesn't mean that she doesn't misdirect yeah i think that some people can sometimes feel that oh well i thought she meant that you think well that's that's the point <laughs> is that she wants you to think that but she's not actually saying that you know if she says this thing and you jump to conclusion a then that's brilliant because she knows actually conclusion b is the correct one but she's just said enough to make you think ah oh, I've worked this out. Of course you never have. I mean, I've, I almost never have I actually solved an Agatha Christie while reading it. I mean, I was trying to think the other day, and there's one or two that I know that I worked out pretty easily. But beyond that, I mean, the other 60 or so, <laughs> she, she absolutely outfoxes you. Even if you get one strand of it right, if you're like, oh, I've worked out that that's actually the secret brother. Um, it's highly unlikely that you've worked all of it out. She's she's too clever for you. <laughs> I've um, so um, her in the the thirties, I think, were her golden age, and, and they're also talked about um, as the a detective story golden age. And, and indeed, that's the theme of this festival. Um, I'm wondering, did Agatha Christie? invent uh, rules for detective stories that we now follow as a matter of course or was she just somebody who um, who, 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 who executed them better than many others um, because I, th I think what happens when something's gone before um, it's very easy to say oh I've seen that before that's not you know that's 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 nothing new and, and yet perhaps it was. Um, not just for Agatha Christie, but literally for en for anything where it becomes popular. Um, so could could you could you perhaps talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So there there were these sort of rules for detective fiction, which were adopted by lots of the key writers of the time. Um, and my memory is failing me in remembering who wrote them. But um, the sort of the Detection Club, which was the group of of, of uh, uh, crime fiction novelists who sort of knew each other, um, they adopted it later as well. And so so it was. It was mutually agreed set of rules and she didn't um create any new ones she did push back against a couple but i'm not going to ruin what they did what they were because those are the twists but it's fair to say that she broke them in a way that was legitimate once you've read the whole novel um you know it, you don't feel um uh, that it's been unfair but the rules were really handy things i think not so much as sort of a set of rigid, if you break these rules, then, you know, it doesn't work, but actually as a general template for what is good detective fiction. And the one that always sticks in my mind is that you should be introduced to the murderer early. And I think that's such an important one, because actually there are quite a few detective books, older ones, where actually somebody will pop up in the last third and you'll find that, you know, great aunt, you know, Jean, who was supposed to be on a cruise, actually had been, you know, living down the road or something and had killed people before we even met her. And that's a terrible cheat because there's no way for you to work that out. Um, so those ve sort of general guidelines are, are really helpful to say, well, actually, in order, not so much for somebody to come and shout at you, but in order for, for the reader to get to the end of the book and feel satisfied, feel they haven't been cheated, that's where those rules are really, really helpful to say, actually, 
the reader is going to be annoyed if you introduce in the last 10 pages or if you introduce a magic poison that that, 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 that can disappear or um, the use of twins, I think, is one of them, which is such a cheat, although she did use that once or twice, but not necessarily um, as a sort of central point of, of a novel in the, in the way that, that might be a cheat. But there are these things, and I think it's fair enough that um, you just go, well, this seems to be how it works. But she didn't... Um, worry too much about them because she was very sensible and going well I just have to be fair and if you're fair then then, then that's enough um yes so so that that's how she approached it really was to make sure that if someone reread it they would think of stuff. but I love the fact that, that that she knew that people were going to be checking this stuff because when she wrote Murder on the Orient Express she went on the train again to check that she'd got things like the positions of handles and doors and everything right. Because if you read Murder on the Orient Express, it is actually quite important where people are and how you can get access to various cabins in different ways. So um, she, she checked because she knew that people were going to go on the Orient Express and go, well, that book doesn't work because it says there should be a connecting door and there aren't connecting doors on the Orient Express or whatever. Or it says if you hang your soap bag over here, you can't see if it's locked or not. Well, you can. No, she knew. She checked. She knew that, that people were going to be really checking. Maybe not checking 85 years later, uh, which is what we're doing, but um, certainly that people would be checking. Yeah, it's because I think, it, as you say, you've, uh, the, the, the writer has, a, has a, a duty to the readers so that they don't feel cheated. Um, and I think that you don't um, necessarily need to have, you know, at your desk a list of rules. They're, they're internalised. And I think that What's important is that they're internalised for readers, um, because a reader doesn't have a checklist of, of you know, mm. what, what did she do? But you, you know yourself whether or not it's satisfying. And it's interesting, isn't it, that, that in, in adapting her books, um, so, so famously, some of, the, some of the more recent ones, Sarah Phelps, is a screenwriter who hadn't uh, read Agatha Christie before. So when she was doing, uh, when she, well, as I understand it, actually, I'm, I'm saying this, and then you're the expert. So, but I'll let you talk about it. So she came new to it, and she was trying to um, honor honor the book, uh, which in many cases are quite dark. And I think that some of the adaptations going back, or perhaps into the 70s or 80s, there was a sense of like, oh, it's Agatha Christie, it's all just a bit of fun, and let's just pop, pop a Poirot in there, um, even though it's not a Poirot, uh, perhaps even more recently. Um, and there's, um, you mentioned, um, oh my goodness, the, the McGinty book, where yes, McGinty. You, you were talking in there where actually, um, uh, the I think it's the, uh, the they put they put they put Miss Marvel in it. They did, um, and it's uh, you know so that that idea I think of, of playing fast and loose. There's there's it's great it's great to be inventive and creative and uh, but you know so I suppose. Um, it's quite. Uh, um, I know that you've. I'd like to talk to you in a little bit about about the book and how you know how one goes about researching all this. But clearly, you you have um, you talked about the uh, her 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 son and, and grandson Matthew and James. Um, they're they're clearly guardians of the legacy, um, and they're trying to make sure that these adaptations are true to what she wanted. I mean, how, how, was she ever disappointed in, in those film? Uh, oh, yes. Oh, she didn't like that. Oh, she didn't like adaptations for sort of, didn't like them on stage. She didn't like them on TV, didn't like them on film. There were exceptions. She lo really liked the Billy Wilder film of Witness for the Prosecution, which is a wonderful film from 1957. She liked that. She, she seemed to not mind the um, Albert Finney murder on the Orient Express from 1974. There's not a lot of correspondence about that, actually, but she, she didn't seem to mind it. Um, but <clears throat> the one that you were talking about there, uh, the Mrs. McGinty's Dead, which was indeed um, made into a Miss Marple film starring uh, Margaret Rutherford in the 60s. And those were the films that actually really started to upset her because they were making these sorts of changes that she felt were quite arbitrary, I think probably were, um, where things like, dropping Miss Marple into a pro novel. There, four, there were four of them um, that starred Margaret Rutherford as Miss Marple, and the fourth is pretty much an original story. You know, that's how quickly they went from adapting. The first one was an, a fairly close adaptation 
by their standards of 450 from Paddington. And then there's two where they put more, uh, Marple in the Poirot novel. And then the last one, they just put her in their own story anyway. So this real sort of drift. And so she found it actually really upsetting. And so what you got then was that, so she had only had one child, her daughter, Rosalind. And Rosalind and her husband, Anthony Hicks, they protected the legacy then through the 70s really, really closely because they saw how much it upset Agatha. So um, when they did, allowed Murder on the Orient Express to happen, it was a big deal. Um, and there were all sorts of provisos for it and that it was a one off and that if they didn't want to do another one, that was it. Um, and so it meant that actually in the 70s onwards, <clears throat> Rosalind and then her, her son Matthew um, were very, very protective over it and really wanted to keep the adaptations as close as possible. And, you know, we're combing through the scripts. I've gone through, you know, some of them in that book, I, I summarise, you know, the comments that, that you would get from them, absolutely combing through. I mean, one that stands out in my memory is, is when she was reading, Rosalind was reading a script for an adaptation of Appointment with Death. The, the things that she was writing that she had objections to included um, the, a British doctor asked somebody if they'd taken their medication and she was like British doctors would never say have you taken your medication they'd ask have you had your medicine you know and then it's absolutely like that that's how you know how absolutely fastidious she was about it but then of course what you get is you get in the 70s 80s 90s these really, for the most part, quite close adaptations of David Suchet series as Poirot, Joan Hickson as Miss Marple. And I guess once you've done that, you think, well, now what do we do? You can't just do them all the same again. And so the perspective of you know, the keepers of her legacy, so Matthew, and, and, and now it's his, as you say, his son James is, is CEO of Agatha Christie Limited. And I don't want to speak for them, but you can absolutely see that their perspective has been, well, you've got to try something new and you've got to give people a bit more freedom. And I think what you get for that is that you get some that, in my opinion, work really well and others that really, really don't. Um, and I guess that's quite an interesting gamble to take, to say, is there any point in doing an ABC murders, for example, for which there is already a brilliant David Suchet adaptation in the 1990s? Do we want to do it again like that? Probably not. So at least perhaps give Sarah Phelps the freedom to try out something new. I didn't particularly like it, I have to say. Um, but other people really loved it. And it was interesting to me that the people who seemed to love it are people who didn't really know Agatha Christie that well and now seemed interested in finding out more about Agatha Christie. Now, it might be that they go and read the ABC murders and think, oh, this doesn't seem to be quite like what the TV adaptation was. But it is keeping her you know, like, interest in her going so I can understand that I don't think there's any point in just making adaptations that are just remakes of old adaptations and keeping very close to it but that also means you've got ones that not everybody's gonna like and there are some that I've really enjoyed and some that I really haven't but so what you know it's 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 done then and I'll wait for the next one and hopefully that will be you know a, a bit more interesting it's interesting Hugh Laurie has just finished making um why didn't they ask Evans which is a much lighter adventure mystery novel. And I don't know anything about it other than what's come out. I'm not you know, privy to anything special. But my guess is that it might be a bit of a reaction against these darker ones that Sarah Phelps did. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. But it'll be really interesting to have a bit of a lighter, more adventure sort of fun, I guess, Agatha Christie um, is my guess, because I don't know why you'd pick that one otherwise. But it'll be interesting to see. Um, these things move in eras. You know, you have a few years of adaptations trying one thing, and then they move on and try another. So, you know, go for it is what I think. It's got me think that, and also, yes, I, I said, I said, son and grandson, didn't I? I meant grandson and yes, great. Yes, I know. Yeah. But you knew, you knew what I meant. Sorry. Um, so, um, obviously, the best adaptation should bring out something that maybe even the reader wouldn't have seen before. But you don't want to override um, the creative vision. Um, yeah. So I think that was the problem with the Margaret Rutherford. Margaret Rutherford is a fantastic um, actor. She, she's just amazing, but she wasn't Miss Marple. So those of us, and I always did love Miss Marple, you know, who had that idea. And also, because um, Agatha Christie does describe 
you know, the, of what, what Poirot looks like, what Miss Marple looks like. So if you decide to go against that, then there, there has to be a reason for it, doesn't it? Otherwise, just just write a just just write something completely different and don't don't say it's a you know. yeah. I th I something that Sarah Phelps did that I thought was excuse me was really interesting uh, was with the ABC murders, which was written in the nineteen thirties. Um, she really brought out what actually was happening in 1930s Britain, which is there in Agatha Christie generally, and there are hints of it um, uh, in the ABC murders. But she wants to make much more explicit the fact that there was a rise in fascism, you know, we're running up to the Second World War here, certainly a rise in, you know, concern about fascism as well, um, and, and sort of political factions, and that within that you've got Poirot who's a Belgian refugee and that actually maybe Britain in the 1930s wasn't a great place to be as a refugee and that there's this there's these really interesting scenes where Poirot isn't taken seriously because he's sort of seen as yeah like lesser less important than than sort of British people and not somebody to be taken seriously um and a bit of a joke right at the beginning so I thought that was really interesting that when you write a book, I guess, you don't necessarily understand the context of that book as well as somebody who comes to it decades later because you don't know what's coming next. <laughs> You're not writing the ABC murders thinking, oh, there's going to be a war in a few years. So it's quite interesting to retrospectively look back and be like, well, actually, what was on the horizon that there were hints of, but that perhaps these characters weren't wouldn't have the knowledge of. Uh, so I think that is a really, really interesting thing that, that she did that with the ABC murders. Um, uh, so that's a great thing that you can do with adaptations is sort of tease out this this stuff. And there were other bits in it that I wasn't keen on. Um, and that's fine. Doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm putting my glasses on because I've just got a message. I thought, my goodness, we've, you know, it's like all these things. Um, you think, oh, oh, we've got 50 minutes and now we've, we've got a couple of minutes. And I, I, I'm, I'm sorry to people watching this because I had wanted to ask you about the, the process of, of writing this book. Um, and we're not going to have a chance to do that. But you do have a website and you do also have some recorded lectures and interviews like this. Um, it's been so fascinating to talk to you. I've loved it. And like I say, your passion shines through as it does in your book, as it does in, in, in every interview I've seen, every lecture that you've given. So, so, so if people want to find a little bit more about you and more about Agatha Christie through you, uh, where, where can they find you, Mark? Yeah, so my website is markoldridge.info and uh, my Twitter handle is at Dr. Mark Aldridge. So you can come and find me there. I'm always tweeting about Agatha Christie. Um, but uh, just to say uh, quickly, I know we've just had a prompt to say that I think we've got five more minutes if we want them. So just to say quickly about what the process was, is that it was a lot of archival stuff. That's what I wanted to do, is really go back, get the context, see what was going on in Agatha Christie's life, see her discussions with her publishers and make sure that people understood the story behind these novels and films and uh, stage plays and stuff and that's what I thought was really exciting um, so that was what my process was really just to say quickly is was about going back to the source as much as possible and not relying on sort of secondhand stories and things that we've heard a million times before that we can't necessarily check the veracity of and I'm not criticizing anyone here but just that that happens you read articles and people say oh Agatha Christie was this or this book happened because of this and I wanted to break that down a little bit really and, and go back so the family archive were fantastic uh, publishers archive um, both of them actually um, so and lots of other smaller archives as well so that's really what I wanted to do go back and hear from Agatha Christie as much as possible hear from her uh, and make sure that her voice was really prominent in the book. So it would have been important to um, to to have the participation of, of her family and of uh, of the people who, who guard her legacy uh, yes. because you clearly did did work with them. You did you go down to Greenway? I was yeah. talking about that. We're almost out. out of time. <laughs> Greenway, which is her ho uh, holiday home uh, in Devon, which is now owned by the National Trust. Yes, I've been there many times. I'm from Devon, actually. So I've been there sort of uh, lots of times. There isn't too much left there because it's all been moved to the family archive, which is in Wales. Uh, and that's where her grandson lives. So I know her grandson pretty well. 
uh, because I've been researching for, for a long time. And he obviously is fantastic, some person to talk these things through and to give me access to this stuff. So um, him and his son, James, who's CEO of uh, Agatha Christie Limited, massively helpful really were interested in the project uh, and I wanted I wasn't interested in doing it unless it had their approval that's what I wanted um that they they thought there'd be some value to it and so really it's been a, you know, a fantastic experience um and probably not over yet I'm not done with Agatha Christie yet. do you think there might be more books because as you say this one I mean and, and it and it's and it's huge I mean this one is is Poirot it's um I mean, it's it's got this, it's got illustrations in it. It's got, like as you say, trivia. You know, all the background, all, all the nuggets from your research that you've distilled down into this into this really enjoyable book. So you think that you, you think there might be more? Yeah, I hope so. Um, I think that that you know we're, we're having chats about doing a sort of Marple book, um, but it's very complicated because you've got to line up different people wanting different things at the same time. But I think there's every chance something like that might happen. Um, and I did I, a little bit of research for it while I was doing that one as well because you never know. But definitely something is going to happen, and, and we'll just have to wait and see. I wanted to ask: Have you ever tried to write a detective novel yourself? Yeah. No, no, never. I'm not a fiction writer whatsoever. And I would tell you exactly what would happen if I tried to write a detective fiction book is I would end up writing, rewriting an Agatha Christie because I just know I would, that I would end up being like, oh, this is a great thing. This is a yeah. really nice twist. And then realising that she'd done it already. Um, no, I'm not. Uh, most people who seriously study or are interested in Agatha Christie that I've encountered, who do it in some sort of professional way, do seem to write detective fiction. Um, and I'm a real exception there. And I'm quite pleased about that because um, I feel like it gives me a little bit of distance, that I'm not competing with her in any way. I can just admire her genius um, and, and not worry about it. No, she's too good for me. I don't have that sort of a brain. I would never be able to compete. <laughs> Yeah, no, and, and, and you clearly do admire her genius, and, and it's been such a joy to talk to you, and I wish we had longer, um, and uh, I, I'd just like to say to everyone who, who, who joined us, who's watching this, thank you so much for joining us, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you, Mark, and, and, you. Um, and, um, and to learn more about Agatha Christie, and um, I, I, will, I will be looking out for what else you're doing and, 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 and following, following uh, what else you've got to say as well. It's just been so fascinating. And um, I'm sorry that we've now run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Helen. It's been a pleasure. All right, thank you. And so um, and, uh, I'll hand you back over to, to, to the people at Pune International Literary Festival. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for such a fascinating discussion. We thank Dr. Mark Aldridge and Helen Smith for being our guests. We will begin our next discussion, The Art of Writing for Children and Young Adults, after a break of 15 minutes. Thank you.